let's go and get our rights back. Like, let's just use it, get our rights back and end this madness so we can all move on with our lives. The reasons for female only spaces have not gone away. So we should not be in a position to have to justify them. I'm sick of explaining people go, but why do you need a female only space? Because we want them. So in 2020, I effectively launched a female-only social networking app where women could find roommates and freelance work and, and lesbian dating and connect like just for emotional support or have a voice. We had like a female-only Twitter style feed, things like that. Then in 2022, I got an Australian human rights complaint from an individual named Roxy Tickle. It was for gender identity discrimination and it was against both Giggle and myself. So it's two respondents in the case, even though I am the CEO of Giggle. Um, and basically in with how it works in the Australian Human Rights Commission, you can settle something before going to court. To In this case, because it was Austral the Australian Human Rights Commission, not a state-based one, it would be straight to federal court. And the conditions for conciliation were so ludicrous, basically, that I would have to let him on. I should say he's a man who claims to be a woman. I would have to let him on, all men who claim to be women, um, go to sex and gender education, which could only be re-education because I know about sex I'm sorry, and gender. Tell me that again. I'd you would be sent on a course. Yes. Which would educate you in gender identity. Basically, it, it was it could only be re-education because what else would it be? Or reprogramming. I, yeah, basically. Right. Um, and then the other, the last condition, which oh, this one bothered me the most, actually. Well, not the mo but more than the other, like letting him on. But it was that I would have to moderate the content of what women would say, so not to offend men who claim to be women. And so I was like, this, you know, we'd set up, created this place where women could have a voice and speak freely away from men. And then you said, suddenly there was this man saying, well, no, I'm going, not only am I going to be there, but I'm going to control what you say. So I said no to conciliation. I was also, I was 15 weeks pregnant when I got the um, AHRC complaint. And by this time of going back and forth, I was end of second trimester going into third and I was, you know, I was having a geriatric pregnancy because I was 37. It's a lovely way of explaining a it's, slightly older pregnancy. It's literally, it's, right. the, it's the next issue after this. Right. That's the okay. next issue I'm going to focus on, <laughs> changing that. Um, but so I said no to conciliation because I knew that I wouldn't agree to any of it. So there was no point sitting in a room going back and forth. I was never going to agree to it. So then he, from that, he had 60 days to file in federal court, which he did. Hang on a minute. Let's go back a little bit. Because I'm sitting here talking to you. I'm a, you know, I'm known to be a very, very hardline, uncompromising feminist. I'm a lesbian. I've been in the trenches arguing with men about rape and domestic violence and misogyny and the like. Okay, so you're clearly an extremely strong, determined woman. But you didn't have that background in this, did you? Weren't you a Hollywood screenwriter at some stage? Yeah. But you came to your feminist consciousness from what I've heard and we've talked before and I've read lots about your case you're someone who has none of it you will not take this from men will you no just give us a bit about your background from Hollywood so I went to Hollywood when I was 24 I stopped doing um, a master's degree in philosophy I stopped one credit shy I really didn't like the, the course I had to the one last one I had to do and I was like oh no and I got on a plane and I went to Hollywood I knew two people and I was like I'm gonna go and write movies how hard can it be and it turns out it was actually relatively easy for me to get into the industry. It took one year for me to sell my first script, which I got signed to one of the biggest talent agencies. I got a manager, you know, I got a proper um, working visa. And that working visa, I was on an O-1 visa and I could only make money selling screenplays. I couldn't even, there were certain deals that would happen later on where they were trying to get me on as like a pro associate producer or something. And I couldn't because my visa was screenwriting. And now, like you know, almost 40, look, I can sort of <laughs> understand a lot of things a lot more of going, I was so naive going over there and actually putting myself in an incredibly vulnerable position. I thought I was, you know, so empowered and strong going and brave going over there, but no. Which you were. Well, I was, but what I was actually effectively did is I put myself in a situation where because I could only make money doing this one thing, 
it meant a lot of people had control over my life. I didn't. And so when I got into the industry, that's kind of when the nightmare started. This is, so this would have, by the time I was in the industry, it's like 2010, 2011, the, this is pre me too. So all the horror stories are true. Like it was horrific. And the reality is most screenwriters are men. So it's, it's, it, there are obviously women screenwriters and there's some that are really, really successful, but a 27 year old Australian sitting there talking about, and I would write about, I would write romantic comedies and they were always about like strong, but flawed women. And they were always, you know, sort of like, sometimes they'd be like sexually liberated or something. And I remember my manager one time saying like, that's your brand, sex is your brand. And I was like, but it isn't. I just wrote one movie about like the stud versus slut mentality, but it's not my brand. It was just, that's just one script. My brand is strong, but flawed women. And so when you go, when you sell a script or you put a spec script out into the industry, you have to go to general meetings. And sometimes you can do like five of them a day and it's, you know, you've got to go and sit there and sell yourself of why you should be the one to write their next script, whether it's your own or one of their ideas. So you've got to, you know, tell them stuff about yourself. So I was basically just sitting in these rooms, giving them this story of how vulnerable I was. This is what I know, like realize in hindsight and the level of sexual harassment that then eventually escalated to sexual assault was crazy. I got to the point I couldn't write anymore. And that was, that was my livelihood. I was just a shell of a person by this point because I was just being pulled in opposite directions. And eventually when I went to therapy for it, she said like I had, my brain was in survival mode. It was just like, don't write a script because the script will send you into the rooms right. where the bad things will happen. Right. So yeah, I, I ended up, I left. I was like, it's just movies. This, is, should, this should be fun and it's not. This is no way to live. It's interesting though, because obviously we're in a Me Too moment right now where women are fighting back very, very kind of vigorously against gender ideology and the harms it's doing to us and to girls and other women. But many of us in this fight that will not shut up, that will not cave in, have experienced sexual assault and sexual harassment. And we've spoken about it and we've written about it, including Joe Rowling and other women in the public eye, but also so many women I know whose names aren't in the public eye. So do you think that when Tickle started his nonsense, and I want to ask you about the detail of how he tried to inveigle his way into the app. Do you think that you just kind of went into that mode of no, not again, I'm not taking this? 100% in the sense of my mentality is really shitty men destroyed the first thing I wanted to do professionally. I'm not letting it happen right. again. Absolutely no way. I don't, I don't, I don't have a third idea. Right. <laughs> it's a good know. idea. But it's like, you know, I have actually spent my professional life women centered in some way, whether it was why I, first of all, it was, I wanted to write movies about them. I was very much write what you know. So I was like, I'll write about being a woman, but, and then, you know, obviously creating an app for women, which is very connected to that because when I was in therapy to recover from what had happened in Hollywood, it was my therapist who said, you need a strong female support network in your life. And I was, it was the light bulb moment. I was like, you're right. This, what happened in Hollywood, it would have been quite different if all of us women were connected where the men didn't know what we were talking about and we could all share our stories. It would have been a totally different situation because that's what Me Too highlighted is that women didn't know it was happening to everyone else. So we all thought it was our own fault. And I don't think it's an accident that gender ideology has replaced Me Too because that was the movement about women's boundaries. Then it was, and of course. a lot of people really didn't, a lot of men didn't like that. And it's been replaced by a movement where women's boundaries are illegal. I 100% agree. To me, it's a men's rights movement. Yeah. It's a misogynistic movement. Mm -hmm. And those that are the trans activists, the ones whose names we know, Tickle and many, many others, India Willoughby, all of them, they are out to take our rights. Yes. And to, as you say, destroy our boundaries. I mean, tell me on that subject, how Tickle ended up on the app and how you discovered that he was on a women-only app. Was it the dating bit? So how, when we created it, obviously we had to work out how to create an online female space that would be female only because you 
You actually can't just leave it up to the good graces of men to leave it alone. I knew that. I didn't know about this demographic of men, but I knew that there were crappy men out there. If they weren't, we wouldn't need a female-only space. Mm -hmm. As much as we do, I think it would still be fun to just hang out with the girls. But anyway, so there is basically AI that can just scan photos and just go, that's male, that's female. It's basically just technology doing what the human eye does. I didn't invent this software or anything. Um, and when when I was told about this, I was like, well, that's fantastic. That's not controversial at all. Because keep in mind, I knew nothing about gender identity ideology at this point. And I was like, well, that's, we can tell like male or female by looking at people. We do it subconsciously every second of the day. And we take selfies all the time. So this is like the complete, like non-invasive, non-controversial way to do this. <laughs> fantastic. I could not have been more wrong. Um, so he went on and he passed through it. That's not because he's a woman. We had it set to 94% accuracy because we found that 94% accuracy, no women, woman was denied access unless it was a really pixelated photo or had no um, depth of field because the, the software would think that it was a photo of a photo. But just on based on the actual individual a woman would not get denied some men would go through and rightly or wrongly we made the decision that we would rather manually remove a man occasionally than deny a woman so he got through based on that and then i don't remember removing him i know it would have been me the reason i don't remember it is because this is not an event Thousands right. upon thousands of men, sometimes every day, like a slow day or a, sl a slow day would be maybe five men, but that was rare. A slow week would be a hundred, like just trying to get on. Again, rare. Most of the time it was thousands trying to get on. And some, sometimes within an hour, because we'd be under attack and so they'd just be coming at us. And we had about, in two years, we had about 10 really big attacks of men trying to get on. And it was horrible every time it happened. Just think about that. <laughs> Why? Do they do it? They can't allow us to have women-only space. They have the Garrick Club, a club that's been in the press today about men-only membership. And, I mean, men have the world. <laughs> yeah. you know, like, it, it's incredible to think that they cannot bear us to have an app just for like, women. When we were developing it, again, I didn't know about gender I identity ideology but one of the examples that I would just think of all the time was Grindr now obviously now it has fallen to this nonsense but when it was created in like 2010 it was specifically male and then on top of that homosexual male only right. that's what it was so I was just like oh look so and then like the her app as well like these were apps that were very sex-based and they're, they're, they're classed as niche apps basically so I was like, ours is just a niche app, just like that. Um, actually, now even you would say the only one because they both, they're a free for all. Um, so, so it was, so yeah, he, he you kicked him out. You so I kicked, yeah, him, I kicked, kicked him out. out. I, I have no recollection yeah. of it. It was just another you? day at the office. Um, then he, a few weeks after that, and this is when he became a person of note in my life, he called and texted my phone. Now I literally have no other person has ever uh, to do with Giggle like as, as a potential user or a ex user or a current user. No one has ever contacted my phone. So he found your number. Yes, and he actually called. It. Yes, and so because the an the only anchor, like the only data we had basically from users, you have to have an anchor for a user so that the app will function basically. And the only thing we had was a phone number. So he, because he called and texted my phone, I just typed his phone number in and I saw. The onboarding yeah. selfie, I said, that's a man. And I called my dad and I said, this guy who um, I was blocked from Giggle, I'm just called and text my phone, what should I do? And dad said, block his number and don't tell your mother because my mom sees the death threat. She, she knows everything that's going on. She watches the whole thing. And so I was like, okay, fine. And I tried to put it, I, I sort of did put it out of my mind because it really freaked me out. But I, so I was just like, just ignore, ignore, ignore. And then about two months after that, I got the human rights complaint. Incredible. So would you say that this was a concerted effort, that this was, I mean, it's difficult, isn't it, to ascribe mm. a kind of um, motive, but. I can't, I can't put a motive to it, but what I can comment on is what I do know in black and white. So 
I'd had one interaction with this person on Twitter, not knowing who he was. I mean, he has like, I don't even think he has 200 Twitter followers. Like we're not talking about some trans rights superstar here. He's a nobody. Um, but in January 2021, he had, I had tweeted about McIver Ladies Baths, which is this um, rock pool in Australia that has been like woman only for like 140 years since women weren't even allowed on other parts of the beach. And so they gave us this little corner. And it's where um, like oh, lots of like women going through cancer treatment, Orthodox Jewish women, Muslim women, and just women generally recovering, for, like they might be recovering from de- domestic violence and want a day out at the beach, but they want to be in that. Or not wanting some man to perv on their breasts exactly. when they're exactly. in a state of It could just be a woman undress. just going, it's just actually really nice to not yeah. have men looking at me. We have the, the, the Hampstead yeah. Women's Pond. Yeah, exactly. Which has now been taken away from us. Yes. So MacIver Ladies Bus was taken away from women as well. But so I was tweeting out in support of them. And this is when the first time when tra- Australian trans rights activists, I think, sort of started to notice me. I'd only been publicly talking out about it all for about six months at this point. And so I, looking back, after I got the Australian Human Rights Commission complaint, I had to go back and find out about this person. And so I found that there was this one interaction. And it wasn't hostile or anything, but he had said, like, you know, I I am a trans woman and I should be in female only spaces, something to, that, something to that effect. And I was like, you know, I wish you well, but no, female only spaces are female only. And what he'd actually commented on was a post I had done about trans rights activists leaving one star reviews and coming after the app and me saying this is what trans rights activists do to female only spaces so that is just undeniable of him being utterly aware of what the situation is and i blocked him again not knowing who he was i just blocked an account from my perspective um and the only reason i know the date that that occurred is because he tweeted sal grover ceo of giggle has blocked me he put it in writing and then he went on the app. So- I mean, it's a, it's a witch hunt, isn't it? It really is. And and here you are now with how long has this litigation been going on so far? Two years and t- two years and two months. And people that haven't been through this sort of litigation have no idea how it drains your entire soul. It sends you to the point of breakdown Mm -hmm. it sucks everything from you it's hell psychologically it is very hard to process being punished in such a way because the process is the punishment yes being so i feel i've already been punished um it is hard to process being punished for seeing a man and acting accordingly because that's actually all i've done that's right i can't i don't i didn't know this person's gender identity so like most people can't even define what gender identity is. Why am I supposed to know about it? I mean, you know, on um, GB News a few weeks ago, that um, Robin... What, what's Moira like? White, yeah, that, the that lawyer. Yeah, so, so someone who's actually like a barrister, he was asked by Andrew Doyle, like, define gender identity, and he couldn't do it. And I'm like, he can't even do it, and he pretends he's a woman. Why on earth are we supposed to know what gender identity is and be able to incorporate that into our lives and in any yet, way? And yet, Julia Gillard, the former Prime Minister of Australia who for many of us was momentarily a hero when she made that speech about misogyny uh, in Parliament and it went viral and we were all clapping her on and there's a feminist. And what did she then do in 2013? So she removed the definitions, or her government removed the definitions of sex, man and woman from the Sex Discrimination Act. So basically we have a Sex Discrimination Act now (laughs) where the words discrimination and act have definitions, but sex does not. But gender gender identity was put into it and it does have a definition in there, which is effectively gender identity is gender identity. It's a circular definition, who knows what it is. And it's about mannerisms, it's about a self-identification. It has no material reality. One of the things about it, um, when you go, I don't know if it's in that core definition, but when they detail it further, they say gendered behavior. And I'm like, what is that? Because that is very subjective, because from my position, Tickle's behavior could not be more toxically masculine if it tried. And then you could also argue that me just saying, standing up and saying no and fighting back is masculine behavior in and of itself. So what, what is this gendered behavior? It's I don't based even know. on harmful sex stereotypes, yes. as feminists have always said, have we not? Exactly. So I'm like, I just, it, it's complete nonsense. And the basically the muddling of the Sex Discrimination Act is why we're in this position. Prior to 2013, 
you could have just had a female only space in Australia. There was no issue. The actual Sex Discrimination Act was in itself the exemption. It allowed it. So long as it was like for, you know, equality and for reasonable yes. reasons. But what female only space wouldn't be? I can't even think of a female only space that would not fit that description. But it's also in terms of discrimination if, for example, um, a woman is working in whichever environment and they don't want to give her maternity leave and she gets pregnant and they sack her. Now, how would that affect a trans-identified male? Well, so this is what's really interesting. So the Australian Human Rights Commission has actually intervened in the case as amicus curiae, which is very normal. They intervene in cases all the time. But the Sex Discrimination Commissioner has intervened in the biggest sex versus gender case, arguably, that has ever happened because it's completely directly dealing with the conflict. And she, the Sex Discrimination Commissioner, is on the side of gender. So, like, adding, oh to, the, adding to the conflict. And in the submission, they say that um, sex is not binary. It is not exclusive to male or female. Sex can be changed. And then it's a 28-page document, I think. And I say to everyone all the time, I recommend reading it. It's publicly available on the Federal Court website of Australia. Type in Tickle V Giggle. You'll find it. Pour yourself a very stiff drink because it is like a draft of 1984 that Orwell was like, you know, no, no one's going to buy this. But the Australian Human Rights Commission went, we'll give it the old college try. We'll implement it. At one point, and this goes back to what you're saying about maternity leave. So they say that, well, they would use trans woman, but I would just say man, that a man's desire to be pregnant is sufficient for him to be considered a woman in law. And what what they're doing there is going through all the different parts of the Sex Discrimination Act that are very specific to women, like maternity leave. And you need a law like that for women because of the desire to be pregnant. You could have a woman that's like 32, she's just gotten engaged, and an employer would be like, well, she's going to get pregnant soon, so we'll fire her so we don't have to Which do is maternity. direct sex discrimination. Exactly. So they're just including these men in that and you're reading it going but they can't get pregnant like i'm sure some of them desire well we see them say it that they desire to it's this a fetish, is wild but. and and so the case is going to the federal court in sydney is that right yes and it starts in april 9th of april to the 9th to the 12th of april is the hearing this will have ramifications not just across australia it's federal mm -hmm. obviously mm -hmm. But elsewhere, because yep. the UK is a signatory to CEDAW, mm -hmm. which is one of the instru international instruments yes. that women rely on to argue that government should protect its female citizens from discrimination, including male violence, mm -hmm. rape, domestic mm -hmm. abuse, etc. And Australia is a signatory and you've ratified CEDAW. Yeah, and what's actually quite unique about Australia, apparently, is that... Because so we 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 enlivened it by basically we signed it in 1983 and then the Sex Discrimination Act came out in 1984, and we incorporated it very thoroughly. Australia and New Zealand are both very thorough in CEDAW being in our legislation, whereas some like in the UK, for example, it's like. I don't know what the my barrister explains it all to me like I understand legal stuff and I don't I'm much more than I do now. We can choose but, to not <laughs> use it if we wish. Yes, yeah, this, this Parliament agrees with it, but yes, but yeah, it's it, not binding. No, so but in Australia, like it, it effectively was, and so CEDAW is about biological females. Now it also doesn't have definitions because it was written in 1979 when no one thought it was necessary to have to. We were just talking, they were talking about women and girls. Like who else would you be talking about? And so, but when you read it, everything they're talking about it is clearly a document about biological women and girls, like of females. There's, you can't really dispute that. I'm sure people will try, but you can't. There's been some like um, things like around the edges at the UN that they've tried to do the yoga Carter principles is sort of mm. the most famous one where they've tried to do these different um, documents, but they have been rejected all the time. They are not signed by the 189 countries that CEDAW has. They've been utterly rejected. So that gender identity is just not part of this document. But there's no such thing as gender discrimination. That does not exist. It's sex discrimination. Well, uh, the only way you would say that that exists is if they were using gender as a synonym for sex, which they which, once kind of did. Some, especially in America, that was a big thing. But now you just can't even use that synonym anymore. But when, but, for example, 
years ago when I was doing a piece of work for the UN, I wouldn't touch them with the barge pole now <laughs> for obvious reasons, the un-women, yeah. you know, they, they sometimes used the term gender-based violence and they meant very, very specifically they meant sex. But yes. the word sex started becoming a little bit too embarrassing to use in case people thought it meant doing rude things. But it's so childish. Do you know what? I'm starting to wonder... Was anyone really having a problem with the word sex or was this part of the plan? Maybe. Because like you could have just kept the word sex and been and just or just had biological sex and been like everyone just grow up and deal with it. But they didn't. They created this Maybe. synonym that is now the part the the the, the problem. Well, talk to me about the case because you can't lose it because then we would sex would be obsolete and gender yes. expression and identity would rule and how would that work it wouldn't it couldn't so you can't lose and he can't win <laughs> yeah. talk to me about the arguments on the other side so and the implications as well one of their arguments um against me is that i treat trans women differently to cis women and i'm like <laughs> there's right. a reason for that. It's on the basis Women of sex. Women only. Has to mean he's, something. He's, I'm, I'm actually. It's like, it, it's like I've got to use. If I've got to use your stupid language, like, I'm, you're going to just have to acknowledge that I'm talking about males and females here. Of well, in the I way that them. Rachel Dolezal, who who yeah. masqueraded as African American, is treated differently from an actual African American. <laughs> Completely. In that and, she's white. And then, but my argument then like beyond that is I'm like, but you want me to treat these people differently because you want you wanted me to moderate what women say based on the demands of this demographic of people. So you can't like tell me to do something that you're punishing me apparently for doing. It doesn't make any sense, but none, nothing with gender ideology makes any sense. But I'm like, just every decision I've made here is on the basis of sex, like they, you know, We've been called trans-exclusionary, like Giggle was, like from when we were first came under attack. And, but I'm like, did any of you stop to think about females with a gender identity? Because they're welcome. They've always been welcome. And they they're actually were, like Giggle's actually offline at the moment because of the case. But like females, like who had some kind of a gender identity, like we didn't police it, I didn't ask, but I would see them on there. Like even women who think men are women are welcome on the app. There's no thought policing here. The only prerequisite is that you are female. That's it. Like it's, so in terms of gender identity discrimination, I just, it doesn't even, it doesn't make sense to me because in Australia, we don't have like a gender recognition certificate. The sex marker on birth certificates is what what is changed. It's horrific. So you, they will be reissued birth certificates as say female. Incidentally, though, when they do, it, the the birth certificate itself um, will say that it's been ed that part's been edited. So it's just this scenic route to confirm that they're still male. Crazy. <laughs> it's so crazy. But I'm like, okay. So if you're telling me that this male is a female, then why isn't it sex discrimination? Right. Like, why bring gender identity into it? Something you can't define that no one could have possibly have known. But even then, you'd be saying that I, I should know what he, what this man's birth certificate should say? Because How? they want it both ways. Yes. And it's about destroying women's rights yes. through the courts. And as you say, the process is the punishment. Mm -hmm. When will you know if you've been successful or not? Which, of course, you will be. So, I mean, the hearing is from the 9th to the 12th of April. It could be July. It could be August. It could be a long time. And so just say we're not successful in the federal court. Um, we would, I would appeal it to the high court. Definitely. I'm not, I'm not backing down. And so the uh, high court in Australia is a court of appeals and it's an error in law court. Mm -hmm. So we would be going to the high court argue and you've got to apply. So, so you've got to be accepted. Um, but we would be going there with a pretty strong argument because we'd be saying sex has been given no weight in the Sex Discrimination Act. But gender has. Yes. Whereas say if we win in federal court and say the other side wants to appeal to the high court, which they could, and they, they could also be accepted, I have no idea. Um, but they would basically be appealing saying sex has been given weight in yes. the Sex Discrimination Act. I can't even so. believe that we're having this conversation. Same about a case that's going to the federal court uh, 
it's it's absolutely bonkers it's crazy well the other craziest part is the censorship on it in australia so i'm in england right now because i was like okay air, airplanes exist i have to get on a plane no one in australia no media will speak to me about it i email journalists every week sometimes every day and i'm no doubt that um some of them have blocked my email at this point but i still send the stuff to them because I would have thought things like, oh, the Australian Human Rights Commission saying that human beings can change sex. That's pretty newsworthy. Right. Like, that's what that's a huge, big government body saying this. Um, no, they don't. And the other thing is, in Australia, like, say, the ABC especially, they will report on how brilliant trans people are constantly. They'll also report on how oppressed they are constantly. So I'm even like, why are you guys writing articles in favour of Tickle? Well, I think I could probably guess why. <laughs> I think that he's not the greatest poster boy, poster trans woman, however they, they define tickle, um, for this argument. And I think that each time a case like this is heard, obviously it's the Maya Forstatter one here, and Amy Ham is going on in Vancouver, the... Um, the Canadian nurse who had the absolute neck to say that biological sex matters when you're a medical professional. But all of these cases, oh, and also, of course, um, Mr. Wax My Scrotum, <laughs> Jonathan Yaniv, Jennifer Yaniv, I think he uh, called uh, himself, Jessica. or Jessica Yaniv, who ended up getting a load of, um, of, of Asian women who were on very low incomes who refused to give him so-called beauty treatment to wax his female scrotum. <laughs> so every time we have these cases that are played out in public, because we feminists and other supporters put them there in the public eye, mm -hmm. I think that the emperor's nakedness becomes more apparent. Yeah. And it, it we see these men and these so-called allies and supporters for what they are. Completely. I completely agree with you. I think that Australian media and the powers that be there, I think they know I'm right. And that's why there hasn't been, from where I'm looking, across the kind of, you know, LexisNexis databases of Australian media, mm -hmm. looking at the mood music on this, I haven't seen the usual requisite three-page spread about this trans woman hero taking on this vile bigot in order to yeah. allow for young trans people to be their authentic selves. Yeah, I mean, when, when um, like, Giggle sort of came out, there were quite a lot of feminists that had a problem with the name Giggle, which I'm hoping at this point I've earned the right for it because there's lots of reasons for it. Um, and I think just it, it worked out perfectly. It created the Tickle V Giggle name. I mean, like... On we literally could not have made it you, up you could not in a Hollywood made, script. You, could, well, you would have been told that's too on the nose, no one will believe that, like, you have to change it. But... Um, I also think, I wonder if, if in the, sort of even on their side or people who think of themselves as supportive of, al al or allies would go, hang on, why is this like 50-something-year-old man wanting to use an app called Giggle? Like there's just lots of questions that regular people could be asking based on that because it is just, you know, the whole thing is just wrong. Like I, I often wonder how all of these so-called, you know, like, the the progressives who are all in on trans rights but say if it was a man who calls himself a man taking me to court they'd all be on my side but it's purely because this man calls himself a woman suddenly i'm the bad one no what can we do to support you obviously your crowdfunding you need lots of money to take this case yes forward uh, we hope you don't need to go to appeal but it's a very, very expensive process, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, so it's for federal court, it's $500,000. We've raised 250000 so far. If it goes to the high court, and I will say there is a high chance that it will go to the high court. So it's another year of my life as well. Like just to put it into perspective, I was 15 weeks pregnant when I got the AHRC complaint. My daughter will turn two before we get a verdict on this. And if it goes to the high court, she'll be three by the time this is all finished. It's monstrous. Um, but so... You know, I'm sort of, I am thinking just long term, like, okay, we've just got to keep raising the money because this could be a million dollars in total. And in the event that we don't have to, and we've got some excess money, there are so many other cases that need it. So Absolutely. we can just sort of pay it forward. Um, so 
um, gigglecrowdfund.com. We created our own because we sort of you know, had the resources to do it. And I'd seen that so many women had been kicked off like GoFundMe yes. and whatnot. And you guys in the UK, you have crowd justice that's mm-hmm. pretty good that keeps that allows women to that's right. stay on. But you have to be a UK citizen to use it. So it, it was of no help to me, unfortunately. Um, but we <laughs> it's sort of just one of the crazy things that happens along the way here. So we created our own and then you have to have like a payment processing thing that you put in there. And I can't remember if it was Stripe or Square that we used first. And those two companies basically own all the minor ones as well. It's a duopoly. Um, they both kicked us off. You were kicked off mm-hmm. after Stripe complaints. and Square. Yeah, Stripe and Square were banned. I'm banned from using both of them. And what in that, I was like, so why do you get to choose who's on your platform? Because I'm just crowdfunding for the right to do what you're doing. That's the irony of this. Extraordinary. Yeah. But we, we can support you. We can also, of course, thank you very, very sincerely thank you. for fighting this I mean, for that's, women. That's what I say like, to people when I'm just sort of saying, like, please, I, like, I, need your, I, need, like, I need the finances. I need the help. The only way I can repay you, other than like, just my endless gratitude, is let's go and get our rights back. Like, let's just use it, get our rights back, and end this madness so we can all move on with our lives. As I said, we've all got other things to do. I want to go and get rid of the geriatric pregnancy right. word. <laughs> And, you know, we have got all those little minor issues yeah. like rape and domestic yeah. violence and femicide and FGM and all of those other issues. All the things that are still happening. It's I, I did a tweet about this the other day. The reasons for female-only spaces have not gone away. So we should not be in a position to have to justify them. I'm sick of ex- like when people go, but why do you need a female-only space? Because we want them. That's enough for me. We We do not have to relive the trauma we have gone through at the hands of men every time we want to defend why we want to be away from them occasionally. Just have a refuge away from you, whether it's online or in real life. And I think that, of course, there's going to be female-only spaces online because that's where we live up half of our lives now. There's going to be more of them. They're going to be in the virtual reality world because we're already hearing stories of women's avatars being raped. Like, men can't help themselves no matter what the situation is. And so, yeah, I just, like... I just think that like the people who should be having to justify why they want to be in them are the men demanding to be in them Mm. because they're the only different thing that's happening here. We need them for all the reasons we've always needed them. Well, what I would say personally to Roxy Tickle is go to the Garrett Club and see if they'll give you membership. (laughs) And on that note, Sal, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you thank you so much and it's i just can't believe i'm meeting you i'm so excited (laughs) and same here thank you again for everything you're doing thank you